Good morning, everybody. My name is George Pesimiso. I'm the vascular surgeon at MD Anderson. I'll be talking today about the uh, management uh, of venous thoracic outlet syndrome, which uh, I like to try to say is the second most common uh, in adult population, equally common in pediatric. Uh, so the uh, venous thoracic outlet syndrome, known as effort thrombosis or uh, paget schroeder syndrome, is pretty much uh, external compression of the uh, uh, subclavian vein as it tracks anterior to the anterior scalene muscle and goes through a very narrow space between the uh, uh, clavicle, the first rib, and the costoclavicular ligament, as you can see in the lower picture. That could lead to uh, stenosis initially and uh, potentially uh, in the future uh, DVT. Uh, males are more commonly uh, affected by females and uh, what you can see actually is the dominant arm is more uh, commonly affected than the dominant which makes sense in terms of external compression from the muscle. So if you see uh, the people who uh, hit the gym all the time and they get really pumped up and they have all these cephalic veins sticking out, right? Well that's cool but it's also a big time <laughs> thoracic outlet syndrome. And uh, it's, you know, it develops slowly as people grow up uh, in brains and in muscle. They uh, basically uh, develop collateral circulation. So that alleviates the thoracic outlet, but the damage is chronic. So we do see this uh, with repetitive and strenuous activity, especially in uh, uh, dominant hand uh, athletes, which would be the um, spear throwing or uh, tennis players, uh, more commonly than others. Uh, and uh, a lot of the times it will be an acute event uh, or it will be a superimposed uh, on a chronic event, acute event. Uh, presents with arm swelling, pain, uh, potential cyanosis. And if you see a lot of collaterals, like you see some of the weightlifters, they have a lot of collaterals here. That tells you that there's been a chronicity in that event. Uh, initially, the diagnosis is duplex ultrasound that shows you uh, potential DVT. If there is no DVT that you can see, absence of facicity will tell you that there is a high-grade stenosis more proximally. Absence of, of uh, respiratory, respiratory variations will tell you the same thing. Uh, if you want to be more precise and uh, spend more money, you can do an MRV or a CTV. And uh, if you plan to do an intervention, you can do a venogram also, which is uh, a conventional way to get more anatomic information. So the treatment basically uh, aims at eliminating the symptoms. So you want to decrease the symptoms and you want those to last, uh, the, 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 the relief of symptoms to be a lasting event. So uh, that would avoid long-term disability, especially in athletes. So standard of care for the most part has been established. Uh, initially, it's, it's a multi-modality approach basically. If there's DVT, you start with uh, thrombolytics. Uh, pharmacomechanical thrombectomy, get rid of the clot, find the problem, you can balloon it, but that's not going to last, you know that, so you have to get rid of the first rib, try to create more space, transect the muscle, the muscle may grow back either by itself or by fibrosis, and then uh, keep the patient for anticoagulation. Now, the anticoagulation is important, and why is that? You have gotten rid of the clot, you have gotten rid of the narrowing. So the endothelium is activated. Once you have DVT, you have an activated endothelium, and that's very thrombogenic, and at least it would form a scar, so sclerosis. So you want to decrease that process as much as possible. That's the goal of the anticoagulation post-op. So initially, you start with a TPA. Uh, you can do a pharmacomechanical anthrobectomy with an angiojet or any other device trellis. I think it was withdrawn from the market, but similar device, and basically you get rid of the clot, and then you lice them a little bit longer. Uh, this is pretty successful if it's uh, in an acute setting. So within two weeks, it's very successful. You can do it even after four to six weeks, but with less success rate. Then you do a balloon angioplasty of the stenosis. If you have a good result, uh, you can wait a little bit before you decompress the area, but you do have to decompress the area. Uh, like Dr. Mato said, you can lift up the arm and you can do a venogram, find exactly where the problem is, because sometimes it's not very visible and you balloon that and plan to do surgery down the road. Um, it's quite uh, controversial when you should decompress. Some people do it right after. They open up the vessel, uh, and some people wait for a few weeks to allow the uh, anticoagulation to work and deactivate endothelium. Uh, so that's still controversial. Either answer is good. Um, 
in general, the approach to the thoracic outlet decompression has three uh, incisions you can do. Uh, supracavicular, which is very good uh, for exposure of the neurogenic and for uh, arterial a little bit, gives you a more posterior approach. Uh, the second one is the infraclavicular, the infraclavicular, which is a smaller incision, smaller exposure, gives you a very good view of the uh, uh, anterior part of the problem, where the vein lies, right, right anterior to the anterior scalene. And there's the other one, which is an even bigger incision, uh, which is a transaxillary, which gives you kind of a wide exposure through the axilla, and you can approach pretty much everything through that. Uh, it's a bit more cumbersome, technically. You're like a car mechanic. You have to go underneath, and someone is lifting up the arm, and you you fix things. Uh, and also you have to go through all the lymphatics, so lymphedema could be a complication, keep that in mind. But it gives you a good exposure. In general, no matter the approach, you really have to take down the scalene muscle, the anterior scalene muscle, as close to the rib as possible, then move on, kind of sharply stay on the periosteum, mobilize the first rib as far back as possible. Then you go the other way, you kind of cut down the costoclavicular ligament, right? Which is very, very much stuck in a tight space between the clavicle and the first rib. Uh, so you have to do with right angle to avoid damage in the structures in the area. And the phrenic nerve could be very close by too. And then you transect the rib as far as possible so you don't have this scar forming and affect the nerves down the road. You can fix the thoracic venous and you can have a neurogenic after that. So this is how a resected rib looks like. You have seen pictures before. You see all the attachments of the muscle. The value of this picture is not to show how blood it is, it's to show you how many muscles are attached in a very small area of the rib. Pretty much there is really no open space. You can see it just, that doesn't work, but you can see this yellow thing, which is a normal periosteum. Well, that's where the vein goes through, right? So it's a very small area. And the more buffed up someone is, the more wide the muscle is. Sorry, guys, I work out too, but uh, we have to have a limit. <laughs> so this is uh, just some studies uh, that show that uh, the results are excellent after a venous outlet decompression, uh, more than 90% patency rate over a couple of years. Uh, and kind of tends to stay high. Uh, you see that uh, it's a mix of approaches. Uh, my preference is infraclavicular for venous thoracic outlet. If you're going to do uh, more extensive, you can do a combination of supra and infra or just supra. But for the venous, I think that works very well. Um, this is a 28-year-old female medical student who wants to be a vascular surgeon and uh, looks up to all these guys in the room and then also is a tennis player. Uh, like Dr. Bachara. So he, she's using the right arm a lot. She comes to you with a two week swelling. Uh, the right arm is swollen, painful, progressively worse the last two weeks. A uh, healthy patient otherwise. Uh, and uh, you decide to do a venous duplex that shows uh, absence of facicity, respiratory variations, and acute clot in the auxiliary vein. So the diagnosis is established. Like we talked about, the plan of care is to get rid of the DVT first, relieve the symptoms. So you put the patient on blood thinners to stabilize the clot. Then you take the patient to the uh, endovascular suite. You do a pharmacomechanical thrombectomy to accelerate the, uh, uh, the decompression of the area and uh, recruit as many collateral veins as you can, which they have developed most likely. You lyse the patient usually for 24 hours, and then you plan to decompress the area. So this is the venogram with access by accessing the uh, 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 basilic vein, which is a preferable access actually in this area. You, you want to avoid the cephalic for many reasons. Basilic is a better vein to access. Uh, and then you try to get the wire through the clot, try to get into the uh, brachiocephalic vein and SVC with a wire. Unless you do that, you can't do anything. You see the number of collaterals already developing. This means that this is a chronic problem with a stenosis and eventually shut down everything. That's why it became acute. So you can see here the wire is into the uh, cava. Uh, you can see a little bit filling on the left side. Over here, the left brachiocephalic. And you see the number of collaterals showing chronicity. We did a pharmacomechanical controbectomy, open up the clot, uh, and uh, there is still quite a bit of stenosis, as you can see here, residual. And all this is a residual clot, so you don't want to leave this in place. So you want to lyse the patient if you see this a little bit longer. If you don't see that, you can go ahead with angioplasty. So you lyse them one more day uh, with specific protocol and parameters. And what you see is uh, the vessel has widely opened. The valves are open and functional. Not completely, but they're functional for the most part. And then you see this high-grade stenosis just in the area that you expect is right here. 
Now that's not clot. That's external compression with some fibrosis of a sclerotic vessel because we talked about this is a chronic event. You can see all these collaterals. And those collaterals are present, but they're not as prominent as they were before, showing that you have decompressed the area partially. So we proceed with balloon angioplasty in the area. And then the next step would be to uh, either put the patient on anticoagulants for a few weeks and get rid of the first rib or do it right away. Uh, so post balloon, there is a decent result. There is still some stenosis. Uh, the vein was decompressed uh, by removing the first rib, which is missing here, and then uh, we did another angiogram to venogram to make sure that it stays open. So first rib resection, repeat venogram, blood thinners for about six months. Some people do three months. That's up to you. There's no standard there. Um, stenting. So stenting is a problem. It's not the answer to thoracic outlet syndrome. It's not an answer to any externally compressed vessel uh, that you don't have a good response or a decent response uh, because of bone. But for atherosclerosis, we use it because you crack the plaque, right? But for the venous, it doesn't work very well. So the problem with the stain is that, number one, it tends to recoil. So you have a stenosis plus a metal jacket. The second is that the area, like Dr. Berchara said, is a very dynamic area. So the, the amount of torque in that area, like this FA but worse, will tend to fracture the struts of the stent. And then you have a ruptured stent, <laughs> which there's no way you can get back to it and fix it easily. And it's a problem if you're gonna do open surgery because you have to get rid of this. It's embedded in the intima of the vein, so it's not easy. So, speaking of that, there are some exceptions to it. You can use a stent in a very rare exception. So this is a, a gentleman with uh, advanced lung cancer on the right side, has been radiated quite a bit and has all these skin changes in the area, it's plastered, right? And then he has this couple of weeks history of arm, neck, and face swelling. When you hear this, you know that it's more proximal event than just a subclavian vein. It's probably involving a little bit of brachiocephalic, so you can have the face swelling there, right? So we did an ultrasound. The patient did not have a DVT, but had absence of phasicity. So you expect there is an iron, but no DVT. We did a venogram from the cephalic vein this time because his basilic was very small. And uh, you find the narrowing, as you can see, in the merge of the IJ and the subclavian. So at the original subclavian and the IJ. And uh, we did balloon it. it. It did respond for the most part. So the patient was uh, placed on Plavix for, uh, for a long time, for six months, the plan was. And then he just came back a couple of months later with worse symptoms on the right upper extremity. So the balloon angioplasty is a great way to have immediate results, but it caused trauma. It's caused, it caused trauma to the vein, so unless you have a more, uh, if you have more space in the area, you have the external compression plus trauma, therefore you can have acute thrombosis. And you can see the number of collaterals again. I point this out because once you see a picture like this, as a vascular surgeon, you have to, to be able to tell this right away. It's easy to see the blockage, but you have to see the collaterals. So this is a chronic problem with a, another acute event, which is the DVT. So we did the approach, we got the wire through, we went to the other side also, because you have a proximal lesion, you may be able to put two stents in the brachiocephalics, otherwise you're gonna knock out the other side if you put a stent proximally, right? If you have to put a stent. So we, we got basically uh, everything, pharmacomechanical thrombectomy, lysis, it opened up the vessel, ballooned, it came right back down. He wouldn't be a good candidate for first rib resection, as you can see the rib is still there, because the area is plastered. You go there, get rid of the rib, to fix a swelling, not a limb threatening problem, a swelling. And the patient has a basically paralytic diaphragm, let alone pneumothorax and a whole bunch of other problems. So you have to balance your risks here. So the stand is not the first choice, it's not a good choice, but on him it was the best choice. And who knows how long it's gonna last. Well, it lasts for him quite a while, for his lifetime, so, uh, which was short. Uh, so you have this patent vessel with a stand going all the way into the SVC. Extensive problem, uh, relief of symptoms. If it goes down, he has time, you know, from all these collaterals he developed to go back to what it was before. And you can get rid of the edema with physical therapy and other modalities we have available these days. So there are several controversies in the treatment of venous thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, plus arterial too, but mainly this one. So if you have a chronically, chronically stenotic vein, and you do all that, you open it up, you do first read resection, and you feel it, it's very sclerotic, very narrow. How are you gonna treat this? So in this case, a stent is not a good option. 
but you can do vinoplasty. You can take saphenous vein, open it up, use it as a patch, and open up the vessel. But if it's occluded, a long occlusion, chronic occlusion of a sclerotic vein, if the symptoms are not that bad, you probably don't need to mess with it. If they're really, really bad, which is unusual, because the collaterals are not developed or they're occluded, you can do a short venous bypass, or you can do inter interposition of the IJ, take the IJ, flip it down, and attach it to the mid subclavian vein, or you can do a spiralized great saphenous vein graft and put it. The outcomes are not all that great. They tend to thrombose, even those bypasses, because the flow is so low in this area. But it's something you could offer to a patient who is more competitive, like an athlete. Uh, and, uh, of course, it has to be followed very closely with long-term anticoagulation. Uh, but this is one controversy. The second one, should you use TENS after you get rid of the rib uh, on a patient that you, you don't want to do venous angioplasty for some reason? Potentially you could. I wouldn't recommend it, but potentially you could do a secondary stenting in that area in high-risk patients very selectively. Uh, what's the best surgical approach uh, to, uh, to expose the venous thoracic outlet um, uh, syndrome there? Uh, Infraclavicular is my preference, but many people would use other incisions like transaxillary. Uh, I think the risks are higher for complications, so infraclavicular gives you great exposure. Uh, and when should you decompress? Once you open up the vessel, TPA, PMT, everything, when should you do it? So there is recent literature that says that if you do it the following day, it has great results long term. Short series, retrospective really most for the most part, uh, but um, there is plus and minuses. If you do it right away, you just put them on blood thinners to follow for the next three, six months, and uh, you don't have to operate on them down the road while on blood thinners. The controversy is that if you wait, if you wait to do it four, six weeks down the road, you actually take advantage of the um, anticoagulation. So the endothelium, which is very activated, okay, the inflammation comes down. So you don't have to work on an activated endothelium when you do the open surgery. Plus, if you find there is a sclerotic vein, you can patch it. And then uh, you don't have to worry about uh, a very activated thrombotic, thrombogenic endothelium at that time. So it's controversial. I don't think you have to rush to do it right away. You can wait. Some people will do it, which is okay. So in general, venous thoracic outlet syndrome uh, is treatable. It's, the treatment is based on early diagnosis with a duplex potential MRV CTV. Uh, Modality treatment would be endovascular plus open surgery to get rid of the rib, and it has good long-lasting results. Um, so long-term, unless you do first rib rejection, you probably wouldn't have good results, but in general you do. Um, venous stenting is in general contraindicated. I don't like it. I wouldn't use it. But on special cases that you have no other option, you can potentially consider it as a treatment.